I'm so excited. Are you pumped? Yes. I'm always pumped. Woo! <laughs> Whenever you're ready, girl. Hello. How are you today? Hi, Eftihia. It's so good to see you. So good to see you. I am so excited we're doing this. I thought it would be a fabulous way to start my Friday morning, long weekend. Um, I have so many questions for you that I think uh, our viewers are going to be very interested in knowing. But I kind of wanted to start with a mini introduction of I've been your student for the last five years. I did my master's and my doctorate with you at West Virginia University. And I wanted people to know that it's your student interviewing you today um, and that I met you in Austria back in 2013. I had found you online. It was when I was researching to come study in the United States. And I just saw all the awesome projects you were doing that were right up my alley. I thought that you as an artist, you breathe life into what you're doing and you are, are enacting, you are the music you're performing. And I thought that was so cool and it's exactly what I needed at the time. So I came and I saw you live perform in Austria and that was it after that. Yeah, I remember that. And um, you know, you're bringing up something that just makes me smile and makes me so happy. And that is just the beautiful process of relationship that we've had and that is the potential with a student, you know, and it's just so special to be a mentor to somebody who starts here and ends up here, or maybe they start here in the middle of the circle and they end up here holographically everywhere. And, um, you know, I just received so much inspiration from, from the beautiful people I get to work with and and you, Eftihia, are one of them. And yeah, we've been to, we were together for five or six years or however long it's been. And we had some journeys with projects and growth. And like, you know, you had done no contemporary music, I think. And, and by the end, you were just slaying it everywhere. So I want to thank you for being an inspiration in my life and in the studio at West Virginia University and to so many of the students who saw your process as you grew as an artist. Well, it has been really nice to be part of a studio where self-expression and exploration are the two words that I can think of. Uh, there was no no for an answer. And it was beautiful because we got to really explore a big gamut of repertoire. Like we did classical, Baroque, modern, romantic, and then contemporary music was just the, the cherry on the cake, the icing on the cake. Yeah, and, and I, think, I think a lot of people think, and hopefully we can talk a little bit about this today. A lot of people think that when you, when you do really unique things with music and art um, and you're kind of known for these unique things that potentially it means that you don't do the other things um, but I think and I mentioned this in another interview I think it was with Tatiana that you know ver like versatility is the virtuosity you know like to be able to just span the spectrum from being able to create the most simplest note in the most simplest context you know, the first note of Debussy Syrinx to taking that note and turning it into movement underwater, you know, or something. So uh, yeah, no is not the right word really ever <clears throat> when you enter into a creative space. I think the word is how and, and why, but not a why, like why would you do this, but like an, a why, like, yeah, how and why is it? And the why answer is because something is seeking to emerge. And then the how becomes, well, how do we create the environment and the space for that beautiful, unique thing to emerge? Um, so you got, think, you got to experience that in our little ecosystem. And that's exactly what I want to be the opener of this interview today. You are such a voyager with music, like you are a traveler. So uh, whether you are time traveling, playing repertoire from different eras or 
traveling in locations and exploring the highs and the lows and all the elements of nature. I mean, you, I've seen only half of the things you have done. And of no, course, you have not seen half after you. Uh, <laughs> that was not half. <laughs> no. <laughs> but it was, it has been such a journey to watch you um, go from scratch, like from, from nothing to a full blown project on stage. Um, and I wanted to talk about how it was for me uh, to experience that while I was at WVU. Like I saw you dance and, and I saw you do rock climbing and I've seen you be the adventurous spirit you are and meeting all these new people and bringing that into your performance. So before I even contact you, contacted you to come study or audition, I saw your video of Reflections uh, where you played Reflections by Maggie Payne with Surrounded by Dancers. I don't know, you were wearing a black gown and yeah. were just playing around with you while you were uh, kind of mesmerizing them with your flute. So I wanted um, not just me, but everybody listening to this interview today to know how you started that. What is it that inspired it? And what is it that made you want to commit to it? for the upcoming years. Yeah, so <clears throat> I'd be happy to talk about that project. And I think in talking about it, I'm basically kind of talking about every project, you know? And, you know, I think it'd be important for our listeners because so many questions came in about work-life balance, about project management, um, you know, about how you navigate all the pieces. Um, <clears throat> so I can kind of go into that at this point or a later point, but, uh, first, regarding the Maggie Payne Reflections piece, I would like to thank Tammy Starr, who is the artist, um, the choreographer, who I first worked with on that very first ever piece that I had choreography to. Um, and so to answer your question, the why of that, you know, what led me to that is, frankly, I think of myself more as like, as I've become older, more as just a creator and an artist. <clears throat> and less as just a flutist, you know, I think of the flute is like one medium. And I think it's taken me many years to understand that really what I am is an artist, really what all of us are, are, are artists and creators. And yeah, we may play the flute and that may be like truly one of our mediums. And so I think the impetus to create and explore and develop and self-express if you don't have the box around you will naturally lead to things like, wow, I wonder how this piece would work with dancers. So that's what happened. I um, think I met Tammy in a gymnastics class or something that our kids were in. I don't really remember. Um, and I asked her like, well, there's this really cool piece for flute and I could, I can see people moving to it like, would you want to choreograph it? So that's what we did. And just to describe for the viewers, and yes, you can find it on YouTube. Um, what, what that was, was I memorized the piece and I think there were eight dancers and the piece starts in the dark and the dancers are lying on the floor all around me. And as the piece begins and as the light comes up, they start to move. And so mm -hmm. you have this like movement on the floor and you don't really know what it is, but you hear the sound of the flute. And that first note has that little tambourine trill in it. So it was just so evocative. Um, <clears throat> and for me, that experience was it. I was like, that's it for the rest of my life. I'm like flying my freak flag, <laughs> you know, because it was just so inspiring. And I learned so much uh, working with um, her and working with the dancers and I would say the main thing is that we are all doing the same thing. We are just working with different mediums. And so um, that's how I view music, art, everything. And every time I go into a project and come back to just simple flute playing, my, my playing is completely transformed because I, I see it with new eyes. I think this is a perfect moment to maybe mention some other projects that you have done similar to that. Yeah be very close to you and kind of at the same time maybe talk about what the challenges are 
as a flutist to make that happen and how you memorize the music, how do you manage your projects, how do you balance life and work. So let's talk about, you, you've done, you've done Winter Spirits by Catherine Hoover with dancer General Hambrick, who is also a professor at West Virginia University. And I just want to plug something to explain why I'm smiling and my face is like bursting out in smiles. So General agreed, and now he can't back out because I'm putting this out there. He <laughs> agreed to submerge himself in water for the first time for this next project, this current project that I'm on. So I am so excited to move underwater with General, who's like the most exquisite dancer, and just to see what happens in a new medium, you know? So that was my little plug, but yes, that was uh, my first time ever doing a piece with one other dancer where I was dancing too. And he basically coached me and taught me because I'm not a dancer, even though I've always wanted to be a dancer. Um, and so, you know, I just, it was an amazing experience. So I, I memorized the piece. Um, we choreographed it. I had never seen the process of choreography in quite the same way. I became very collaborative because of the sounds and the technicalities of what the flute needed. And, you know, one of the things that came out of that is like, I had to completely destroy the rhythm in that piece. Like, you know, because it's a good thing she writes freely because freely is what I did, you know? So I learned that you need to breathe and you need to breathe more when you're dancing and moving and the dancer needs to breathe and the dancer needs time to like maybe switch something up. And so suddenly the music became truly a vehicle for this incredible expression. And it wasn't just these notes on the page that had meter and, um, so that's just, I, I just went off on that a little bit because I got excited when you brought that project up. That's great because similar projects that you've done and I've seen are Sounding Landscape with dancer Yoav Kadar, who's also a professor at West Virginia University, which is funny because both were my professors as well for a while. Uh, and I know exactly how they are, and I, I can just so see the chemistry in rehearsals. I'm going to go into rehearsals as well, but you've done that. Then you did um, the rock climbing project. I don't know how many people know about it, that you had dubstep music created, and you collaborated with younger people, and you created this ex visual experience of rock climbing and the flute. Yeah, that was really out there. That was me flying my freak flag for sure. And you know, what was interesting about that was when that became, when that was put into the context of a concert, I remember thinking, because, okay, let's explain this for the audience. So there was a video created of, of this rock climbing up uh, this um, thing. It was called Queen Victoria in Sedona. So it was, it was a climb that was that was shot on video <clears throat> with my flute on the back. And it, we were so high that you could even see like a, a helicopter went below. It was really cool. And um, so I had this footage and I was like, okay, so what if I turn it into like this MTV thing and I, you know, I get someone to create dubstep and we turn this this climbing footage into something really gritty, you know, not just um, flowy or whatever. And so we did that. And then in the live performance, the video was on the screen, the dubstep was blaring, and we had a mob, uh, what's it called, a, a flash, mob. flash mob. We had dancers in the audience who were audience members uh, suddenly get up and start to like act like they were at a rave. Yes. And people were like, whoa, what's going on, right? And then they like worked their way down on stage and they were just like shredding it and like dancing yes. um, and going crazy. And, but uh, you do the, all these projects, right? You're constantly creative. You're constantly thinking about where has the flute not been? <laughs> what has the flute not done? What can I do to take it there? So how do you balance work and projects and how do you find yourself um, approaching the organization of those projects? Yeah, so this is huge. Like, this is a huge topic. Um, I'm going to try to answer it really simply. 
the first thing is I used to, like if I would get an idea, you know, you what happens is you move into this phase of like gestation where you have this idea. And then like the project literally has a life cycle. It, it peaks, it plateaus, you have to find ways to kind of keep it alive. There's grunt work, there's the creative work, which is super exciting and makes you want to do nothing else but your project and all of those elements. And, and there's also like a fade away and sort of a dying aspect to a, a project, not complete death, but you know, maybe the energy just gets reincarnated into your next project. So, you know, so there's like this cycle. And when I was younger and entering into these project phases, I didn't quite understand the cycle and I would get, con you know, concerned and confused and I would get overwhelmed because I wasn't managing the energy and the pieces and understanding that, that there actually is a life cycle to a project. So um, to answer the question very simply, um, I think that the best way to approach projects and your work is to understand what spaces they're in and then to organize your time. And especially when it comes to projects, you must have large chunks of unstructured time because it, it involves getting into flow. Mm -hmm. And so I think understanding that, um, you know, there are other kinds of project challenges too. So they're like, internal challenges so for example you're faced with challenging yourself as a person like um how far am i going to go like with the dubstep project i think that was like a little far out there for me you know i remember thinking like but that's well, something you do <laughs> i don't know that was like even out there for me but i did it you know and you know so you have these internal challenges like what are my fears? You know, what are my inhibitions? And how do I release them? Do I want to release them? How far do I want to go? Um, and then you have like the project management challenges. So there's there are issues of endurance and actually time management and understanding your circadian rhythm. Like what part of the day, for example, are you most creative? You don't want to stick your grunt work in your creative part of your day. You want to understand this is my creative uh, part of the day. This is when I like to be free and I don't want to be constrained. So you do time compartments. Yeah, or or just an understanding of, for example, I typically teach in the afternoon, as you know. And yes. the reason for that is the morning is like the most creative, powerfully time. creative time for me. So yes. if I'm working on projects or even just getting grunt work done, like I need that sacred space. That That's a space that just, you know, people, I, yeah. So, so understanding... Let's make it more visual and um, tangible for the viewers. You had this project where you brought sounding landscape to life with Yod Kadar. And I do remember you, and correct me if I'm wrong, working with the flow of your uh, dress and how it should be designed so that it uh, complements the movement. And I do remember that choreography being a step up from previous choreographies, right? I do remember it being significantly a step up. Yeah, it was huge. It was it was a lot of work for me and a lot of growth. And you had lots of rehearsals with him and then you created an ex a visual experience again, letting us know how those rehearsals, uh, the process of those rehearsals, the progress made. So somebody gives you this piece, it's entirely new. You've envisioned the dancing in it. How do you go about it? How okay. that's that's a great example because that project was just last year. Yes. How do you learn it? How do you memorize? Okay. So what happened there was I I heard this piece in a master class that I was teaching in Slovenia, and the composer is Slovenian. And when the student was playing it in the hall, and I had never heard it before, I was like listening to it, and I was like oh my gosh, like this, this piece needs dance, you know, it was just so visual and contoured. So then I got the piece, I brought it home and I was like, well, I think I would love to work with Yoav. Um, you know, he and I hadn't collaborated before. So I asked him if he would be willing to meet with me and listen to me play through the piece and see if it captured his fancy. So mm -hmm. we met, I played it and he was like, yeah, 
I can see this being danced to. So we agreed to start the project together and then it was a matter of basically setting up dates. Um, the first time we met, uh, I showed him that I had structured the piece with markers and set up sections and labeled them with numbers so that we could refer to like one, two, three. What's interesting about that is dancers don't tend to look at music. They, mm. they think conceptually. So again, really great learning experience on my part, you know, and um, and then we began with the first phrase and, and a concept, you know. But learn the piece along with the choreography? Yeah, that's a super question. So the first time I ever did, which was the Winter Spirits, the dance piece, I memorized the piece and then I went into the dance studio to have my rehearsal with General. And as soon as we started moving and being in space, I lost it. I couldn't remember the notes. And I realized that I had actually plugged the memory in some part of my brain where movement couldn't access it, which was fascinating neurologically. So I had to re-memorize the piece with movement mm -hmm. and with solfege. I also used solfege so that I could hear. To the memory question, I, yes. Yeah, it was fascinating. And so then I went into the score and I had to write, okay, left, right. And then as I was practicing, and re-memorizing the piece, I was integrating it with movement, which was, again, interesting, very interesting neurologically. So same thing with, by the time I worked with Yoav, I already knew that. I was like, I'm gonna have to like memorize this with movement. But I memorized the piece just to get it in there. And every time we made it, I videoed our rehearsals. Every time we made decisions, I wrote them down. And then the process just began um, of us continuing to meet to rehearse. I think we put like 30 hours into that piece. Of you, do you remember how long it took you to complete it? Like how many months or weeks? I don't remember, but I think, I mean, I think it was 20 hours of, I think for me personally, it was 30 hours of work, like memorizing the music and meeting with him. And then the process of performing it began, which, you know, takes you to stages and how the, the concert, the performance develops through stages. But yeah, so you have your internal challenges, you have your project challenges, you have your flute challenges, which are the breathing, the memory, um, you know, when you're bending, how does that affect the sound? Intonation, forget it, don't even think about it. You know, um, there's, a, there's a spot in Sounding Landscape where I'm on a high A and we, organized it so I was literally lying on the floor by the time the high eight was happening and I was writhing so I'm like lying left playing the high eight Yoav jumps over me which was like horrifying and scary he jumps over me and then I move this way and you know I had to figure out this the entire sequence body wise of how am I going to get the breath for the A how am I going to support it in this position how am I going to move out of the position um, but yeah, so that's just a little kind of insight into the sort of project challenges. Which brings me to my last question, uh, physical endurance. How yeah. much do you think physical endurance plays a role in you delivering a project like this? Or is that something you are developing while building a project? I think you, you develop a physical flute playing type of endurance. Okay. You know, like, like, I don't know, everybody's in different kind of personal shapes, so it's different for everybody. And, and you tend to move in ways that your body wants to move. So if you're like at endurance level eight, then maybe you would naturally gravitate towards a certain type of movement. But the flute endurance is a real deal thing. Um, the breathing, you know, even with this new project, Hydrology, I'm so incredibly challenged by this project, this particular aspect of Hydrology, the deep blue because I'm dealing with breath in a completely different way as a flutist for the first time. I have to take a deep breath and then I submerge myself and create some kind of movement and capture it. And basically it's like a phrase, it's like a musical phrase. And then I come up for a breath and I go down and I create my second phrase. And again, it's just all beautifully interconnected. So that's requiring a different kind of endurance because it's a different kind of breath. Um, so you're talking about, you're talking about breath and we're talking about creating these artistic experiences, musical experiences 
Which brings me to another aspect of this interview. One of my favorite CDs, uh, Value, that is, I think you released that in 2016. It was when I was going for my master's into my doctorate. And I remember listening it over and over again. Um, it was Coco Pelli by Catherine Hoover that really had me hooked. It was the energy in that recording. What I thought I could see Coco Pelli. Like I remember that experience for myself and it was just a recording. Um, and I wanted to talk about how, what was the inspiration behind creating that album? Maybe lots of people don't know that uh, Value is actually a uh, Hindu uh, god and he represents, he's a lord of the winds, which is literally breathing life, the life giver. So what inspired that album? It has gotten lots of reviews and then I'm gonna go to something else that is related. It's like- uh, a uh, Looks like you're, you're ready to move on. Yes, but I want to listen about the CD and how you put it all together. Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of keep this short too. So Bayou is my fifth CD. I'm in the middle of two more CDs right now and they've been sort of stalled out because of uh, the pandemic. Um, and I have always loved the fact that you create sound with your breath in the flute. And, you know, the music like on the page, there's just little black dots. They mean nothing. It's like you could take that page and you could scrunch it up and just throw it away, right? But it, it isn't until we like breathe into the flute from like our internal breath and our internal spirit that like those little black dots become something and then they become nothing, which is what we're talking about like with this movement and releasing the rhythms and forgetting about this and that. Um, you know, with Coco, with Coco Pelli, which you mentioned, yeah, I, the freedom of having worked with dance and kind of said, saying goodbye to certain aspects of rhythm is what allows you then to create with um, sound a freedom and a soundscape. Mm -hmm. So uh, the breath aspect is exciting to me. And the reason I titled the CD Value is because of the breath energy that infuses power into the flute. And then the pieces in that CD range from, I think, um, is Syrinx on there? No, it ranges. No. They're it, all like, mm, what's on there? <laughs> after, no, after 19, which, oh my, that is also the other thing I wanted to ask you about, you know, past projects and how you live the, I'm going to get to that as well. Let's focus on value. Like, it, I think it's works after 1962. Yeah. So, you know, I have Shakuhachi Japanese inspired pieces on there. I have uh, Zoom Tube. I have uh, this great piece, uh, Tenderness of Cranes by Shirish Corday, which is literally one of the hardest pieces I've ever, ever encountered. And for anybody watching right now, Value is actually on Spotify. Me showing you that this is on Spotify was not. Yeah. So the CD, you know, was the sort of like, here is what the flute can do. You know, it's all solo works for flute, extended techniques, some not. Um, but the idea was like with this simple breath, with this spirit and intention and breath, you can fill the instrument and then you can bring to life the vision of composers in your own special way. Like they, they send it out like as a paint by number thing and you can choose, are you gonna paint by number? Or are you gonna stick your little paint thing in there and just hit yellow and dab a yellow in there? Or are you going to paint and use the use their piece as a template for yeah. something that's like almost different completely, right? So um, that was the inspiration for that CD, which I think answers your question, right? Yes, absolutely. And you've recorded other CDs as well previously to that that are themed and are representing a very specific concept, like your Pan album. Um, for anybody interested in discovering your discography further. However, for Vayu, what I wanted to know is, was a trip or a life experience behind your, um, your inspiration to represent the Lord of the Rings? Because all the works you chose are contemporary. They are from the, 20th, the 21st century and they are multicultural. Like I think no composer comes from the same. Yes. 
that's yeah. the point. That's the point of the CD. It's like here, here, here. Everybody is a spectrum to look at. It's a kaleidoscope of sorts. I kind of wish I could answer your question with some great philosophical, beautiful answer, but I would have to say, honestly, the title of the CD is just because Bayou is wind and the infusion of life and wind. And I liked the way it looked visually. I mean, I really kind of, you know, the, a CD project is a project in its entirety. So How do you approach a CD project? And again, that, that is probably a, a loaded question as well, but how long does it usually take you? How did you decide the studio or your collaborators? Yeah, so every project, just like the CD project has its own, you know, cycle. So I, I think the first step is the idea comes and then it's like, all right, what pieces, what little children am I gonna align up and who's gonna play nicely with each other and what order should they be in and, and is there a flow? So I picked these pieces because I like them, because uh, some of them were really challenging for me and I wanted a challenge. And um, I created the project and it can, you know, there's the, the time you need to learn the piece, then, uh, then there's the time for the recording, then there's the editing. And then, you know, so uh, I, I can't honestly answer how many hours go into making a CD or making this one, because I don't remember. I, I sense it more in terms of just the project flow. And you know, one thing I wanted to say is it's really funny, but once like a project is done, I'm kind of like over it. Like, <laughs> I just, I mean, it, it was fun. I'm really into the process of these things and um, it, they have their cycles, you know, and then it's kind of like, all right. You immerse yourself in it and then you move on. Yeah. I think that ties in nicely with what you said at the beginning of the interview where you feel the energy of a previous project maybe gets uh, uh, reincarnated into the next one. I think so. I think if everything you do becomes part of the fabric of who you are and then you're able to dip into it and pull from it and use, you know, use those experiences to infuse something greater, which is what I'm doing with this hydrology project too. I mean, yeah, all the, a lot of aspects of this project is completely, completely new for me. Like this is a totally new dimension. But I kind of wanted to bring to, I know you're going to hydrology, which is submerging in water. But I kind of wanted to bring something up in the surface. I don't, I don't know how many people know that this cover is actually your own artwork or that you are a visual artist or that maybe you have a painting gallery on your website. I don't know how many people know that. And I see a painting right behind you right there. Yeah, this is, so this is one of my first abstract paintings. Um, and I, I, I like it because it's like messed up in some ways, but it reminds me of the artistic process. There's actually two paintings underneath that. So I was like really struggling with kind of like gathering and organizing the shapes and colors. And eventually I just took the gesso, which is what you cover a canvas with, and I just like dumped it on the canvas and scraped it across so it would have a new beginning. That's what the high, the high part of it is. And then the gesso dripped and it went over the layers of the painting that was behind it. And I was like, aha. Uh -huh. And then I just started to kind of paint into uh, the clear new area and paint into the drips. But yeah, I am a visual artist and I knew you were gonna ask about that and the Vayu. So I actually have the painting with me that Vayu was, that the cover for Vayu was created. I really do want viewers to see the difference between the little CD cover and the initial creation of it. <laughs> I want to so magic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like that is insane. Like I would love that painting in my living room or my studio. Yeah, How do you create I, I, love, I love this painting. I love this painting too, but I don't have it hanging up anywhere because it, it you know, paintings have like, energy right it's not it's like I don't listen to my um I don't walk around cooking pasta listening to my cd recordings it's just like it may, but I, I love this painting this painting has like you can see here too that there are like these dimensions of color underneath and layers on top how have you created the 3d you see that line the yeah. lines that are popping out so, uh, you know, you can create texture in a lot of ways. Um, this is highly texturized. Um, I don't know how well you can see that, but, you know, there's like this kind of this clump of 
um, paint here. And then there's the, there are these layers. These were dripped on. And some of the, this other stuff, these clumps were applied with a palette knife. Um, and some of the paints were scraped off and some of the paints were squeezed on and some of the paints were dripped with like, um, this reminds me of our lessons right now. I feel like we are having one of, I, I'm having a deja vu where yeah. we, we are in our lesson and professor is showing me paintings and I see here, you have to create those pastel colors. Yeah. This to be misty and pastel -y, and then we just have a painting in the studio and we just find the pastel colors. So yeah, I mean painting is a great analogy for for flute playing and tone colors and again it's like all one language or one message just one vocabulary but different mediums you know so painters talk about like the triad of colors they talk about line they talk about form um, and we the rhythm, the rhythm of the brush strokes, you know, so the more you get into art, the more you realize like everything is the same thing. It's just a, a little microcosm of each different other. approach. Kind of like that is very nice. I really, really wanted us to see that painting. It's like one of my favorite and the cup, nice to, you know, it was nice to pull it out this morning because it's honestly just been sitting up like in one of my offices upstairs and I just don't feel like hanging it up, but um, but I do love this painting, so it was nice to look at it again. And the cover of your book, The Virtuosic Flutist, is yeah. also painted by you. Yeah, so I don't own this painting anymore because I gave it to Amy Comley, who I want to give a shout out to. She was one of my wonderful, beautiful students who actually um, helped, you know, with a lot of with all of the um, input importing of all of the the notes but yeah so this is the cover of my book and again it's also very highly texturized the painting you can see that it's quite texturized That's yeah, so i mean i i am um, basically from now on for all of my cds and all of my publications i'm just going to create paintings i decided because a holistic approach to <laughs> art <laughs> Like seriously, um, that's so nice, which brings me to a recent post that I saw yesterday. Um, my professor submerged the flute in water and it has uh, over 11,000 views and lots of comments. I just wanted you to maybe share with us. Yeah, what... it was, you know, it's really interesting. So First of all, I submerged the flute probably like nine days ago and I created that video a little while back. And I wasn't ready to release it as part of the hydrology notebook process project that I'm laying out on Facebook, um, just because I was still working with so many elements and I wanted to sort of move ahead and time how I release aspects of the project and be very careful about what aspects of the project I'm making public and releasing because you know with creative energy you have to like hold some things in and some of those things they stay only in your mind and your heart until they come out other things you you tell just to like your very best friends you know like this is what i did today um so i yesterday i posted the uh submersion um and that was the first time i put the flute underwater and I was exploring like navigating and learning that I, I mean I learned it's extremely heavy underwater which helped me then understand that I had to find a way to float the flute and in my later explorations which again will be kind of laid out in a slow manner um, I will say that actually my my newest thing is to have the flute rigged with fishing line so the flute is actually going to be suspended in the water and has already been suspended in the water with fishing line, which works well because then I can swim under it and float around it. But in terms of that post and what happened yesterday, you know, it was really interesting to see like 11,000 views in like less than 24 hours and people, you know, having reactions to it. And I, you know, that's what cutting edge kind of art is all about, right? Going where we haven't been before, explorers. That's why I said you are a traveler. I did, I opened up with that. It's, I don't know how much you want to share about the hydrology being that it is a baby developing right now, 
but if there's if you want to share with us maybe how you've envisioned it or where you're going with it sure i would yeah. like um, so I am in the creative, very much in the creative stages of this project. And the reason I'm actually keeping a sketchbook on Facebook is because in past projects, people have been like, well, how did you do that? Or how did you develop it? So my um, decision to keep a process journal, and it's very minute compared to what's actually happening. Um, on Facebook is to allow people to see how these processes unfold. And there's a lot of exploration involved. I had a post uh, two weeks ago where I showed myself struggling with red tool underwater. I mean, this material, like I couldn't even move it or pull it. It was so difficult. And I think that's interesting, you know, and the color red, I decided I don't really like the color red for this particular piece. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, about the project, um, it's going to culminate in a concert, which I think will be called Hydrology, although that title might change. And it has dimensions that um, basically include the river, three rivers in West Virginia, river life, river people, river stories, and then aspects of water. And um, so, uh, and then flute music that complements the journey of the listener as they move through this water and river cycle. Um, and so there are a lot, a lot of video, uh, there'll be a lot of videography, there's going to be poetry, there are gonna be readings, there's gonna be live dance. Um, there's a piece by Robert Aiken called Icicle, and that will be um, choreographed and done live on stage. So that's another aspect of water. And then there will be just a sort of infusion of the flute and how flute playing is like, is like water and you know we we create sound with water it's vapor and so just a sort of other layer of of flute um the inspiration of sound the fabric of water the fabric of fabric the fabric of music and that's kind of a little bit of a picture that's nice yeah. i am i am truly excited for this one um because i think Nobody has submerged the flute for such a project, and this is going to be the new element that you're exploring. You've been on the mountains. Yeah, well, it is, it's it's a new it's a new medium. I mean, just moving through water and grappling with fabric, and um, you know, figuring out how to rig flute and dealing with bubbles. Bubbles are these beautiful things that I didn't know could be so expressive, but they're attractive. The bubbles. They're beautiful. Yeah. They're you can just sit there and look at them. Yeah. In fact, yesterday, I'll, I'll put this out there for fun too. A friend of mine um, asked, recommended that I um, buy an aerator, which is the thing that you put in a fish tank. Yes. <laughs> I, yeah, I like, you know, and all these beautiful people in some ways are part of this project with their ideas and um, but anyway, so I bought an aerator and 50, 50 feet of cord. And so the idea is that the, um, there, these bubbles will be continually part of uh, the images and the, the aerator will be, you know, the, the cords will be submerged and the bubbles will be there and I'll be navigating the bubbles. I might even be pushing them around. Um, but yeah, like every day, something new. You did mention in your sketchbook that when you were playing around with the keys and the bubbles were coming out of the holes that you could, that you could hear subtle air sound yeah no you can hear you can hear the pitches literally the pitch is it's unbelievable so like you're on a b and you're blowing and you hear brrr, at b and then you go to b flat it's like brrr, 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 all the way down it was amazing i'm like whoa <laughs> i know i don't I, there was a way for somebody to record that subtle air sound i feel it would be such a new effect for electronic music yeah well um you know, one of the pieces in the concert project is going to be a piece that uses water sounds. Nice. And um, that would be one of them. And it will hopefully be an, it will be an electronic piece for flute and electronics. But I have to figure out who's going to write it. <laughs> maybe, maybe you do, maybe you do it after here. So <laughs> that's going to be cool. Um, 
This is so wonderful. I am really excited and it has been really nice to talk with you today. Um, I guess just keep up with the sketchbooks because I want to see where you're going with it. Yeah, thanks for following the project. And um, it was, it's so good to see you. And I just <laughs> want to thank you for your questions and your passion and, um, you know, being part of the fabric of my life as a teacher and an artist. And, you know, a great journey. It's a beautiful journey. It has allowed me to be as creative as I wanted to. Yeah, well, you've done beautiful things too. So I encourage you to put your work out there more if you can or will. And if you, you know, enter into something, you know, let's, let's make this a thing, right? There, flute players should be doing crazy stuff, right? <laughs> should be, it's all about the creative process. I totally agree. And you just went back. The studio is all together right now. Yeah, so we are back in session and with a new crop of freshmen and doctoral students. And, um, it, you know, we started this week and it's exciting. It's going to be at the highest levels these upcoming months. That's great. Um, I wish you the best. I know we'll see great things with this hydrology project. Thank and you, Kihia. Thank you for your time today. Absolutely. And good luck putting together the two new albums that are coming up. Do you want to share anything about maybe what's the concept behind the two albums coming up? This is what happens when we start talking. We were, we were trying to wrap this up like three things ago, three sentences. Ago. All right, this is my little PS since you threw a PS out there. Yeah, so I'm in the middle of two other albums, um, but the pandemic thing it didn't allow me to travel to Slovenia this summer. One of them is um, all new works for two flutes and piano. Nice. Um, which kind of, there aren't many works for two flutes and piano or albums and they're really cool pieces. I mean, a lot of them are very spectral. Um, so that's what that is. And we're one piece away from finishing that album. And that's with Matej Grahek and um, Tade Horvat and just some other people who are involved. And then the other album is the second volume of Vayu. Nice. Okay. I won't, say, I won't say anything else. You're just going to have to wait to see what's on that. But are you making a new painting for that one? Yes. Okay. Cool. Thank you, Eftihia. Have a great